it's got pecan sauce on it. It's just, you know, we can't have Christmas without having monkey bread, no matter what else goes on. Uh, so, um, and also we have other, you know, traditions, like sometime during the Christmas season, you have to watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I mean, it's a, it's a hard, fast family tradition. We've already watched it this year, you know, like two weeks ago as we watched... Uh, National Lampoon's Christmas. I'll probably watch it again. But tra- traditions kind of give us predictability, and it's so good to know what's going to happen. You, t- you have this routine that you go through. But the one thing about Christmas is that, that, sh- that you always think about is you don't want to ruin Christmas. You know, you ever worry about ruining Christmas? I mean, there's a variety of things that can ruin Christmas. Getting the flu can ruin Christmas, right? Uh, stomach virus can ruin Christmas even more than what the flu can ruin, can ruin it. Or, you know, if you've got a weird Uncle Harry that gets drunk and calls his sister fat and ugly, that's going to ruin Christmas. Or the, the five-year-old kid that unwraps all the presents and then goes, this is stupid stuff, I don't want any of this junk, I hate Santa. You know, that ruins Christmas, something like that. So whatever we do, we don't want to ruin Christmas because everything has to be, you know, in order and kind of perfect. And for a week, we have to be fully actualized adults and mature and avoid of any fleshly weaknesses and at peace with ourselves and God, or we might ruin Christmas. We probably have stories of things that have happened that, uh, you know, didn't exactly go as planned. But our stories are nothing. I found this one. Robert Schaff, uh, he's got it all beat. He spent Christmas trapped inside of a full septic tank. Really. 77-year-old man in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, had a problem with the toilet on Christmas morning, so he went out and got in the septic tank. I mean, what else are you going to do, right? You don't call anybody. You, you, you do this yourself, and he opened up the lid, and he fell in. And there he was, trapped in there with his legs up in the air for, you know, over an hour. And he's finally, his wife says, I wonder where he went, you know. So she goes looking for him, and he sees him down in the septic tank with his legs kicking. I, I look for his picture doing that, but at least his wife was kind enough not to take a picture. Now today, you know, our wives would take a picture. They go, oh, this is too good. He's down in the septic tank. Get my phone out. Take a picture of this. But at least she didn't do that. But, you know, he was down there for over an hour before she called 911, and the police came and the fire came and extracted him out of the septic tank, and he went in and took a really hot, long shower. Now, that's ruining Christmas. Match that. You can't. Kind of makes, you know, <clears throat> when you get busted for, you know, uh, regifting or something like that, look pretty mild. So, after all, Christmas is the most wonderful time of year, so the song says we don't expect Christmas stories to end up in a septic tank unless, of course, you know, Cousin Eddie shows up and then anything can happen. But we tend to picture Christmas as kind of a sterilized holiday with peaceful nativity scenes and family dinners served on Christmas china, and everything comes out just perfect. But the first Christmas, of course, was actually a lot closer to the guy in the septic tank because it got pretty nasty. The Christmas story of Jesus' birth that we find in the Bible is a scandalous story of God breaking the rules. And if you don't believe that that's true, just, just think through the story for a second. A virgin gets pregnant. Okay, Uh, A carpenter decides not to divorce his fiancée when she shows up pregnant. Some smelly shepherds, you know, kind of tromp into town to visit a baby that's been born in this foul-smelling stable. And God even breaks his own law by having some heathen, heathen astrologers be the first official visitors to visit this child. And from every angle, the holiday that we celebrate Uh, with candles and garlands and bows and toys and peaceful songs. The first holiday broke all the rules. So we're going to take some time this Advent to kind of stop and understand what the story of the birth of Christ really says. And maybe we need to look at the scandal so that we can see Jesus as he really is and follow him as he really is. And maybe we need to meet Jesus, the, the rule breaker. And that's our theme Uh, God broke the rules of nature is today.
Now, as we go through this in kind of chronological order, we're going to jump back and forth between Luke and Matthew. They, they both have the story, and uh, Luke shows us the prophecies of the birth of Jesus and, and John the Baptist from Mary's point of view. And uh, Luke is perhaps the most historical of the Gospels. Uh, Luke sought to, to give, as it says in the beginning, an orderly account of things. So he begins telling the, the births of John the Baptist and Jesus, and in both accounts, uh, Luke tells how God's messengers came to uh, John's father, Zechariah, and to Jesus' mother, Mary. And, of course, these details are included to just show how God was at work through those births. But throughout the story, God breaks the rules of nature. Elizabeth, Zechariah, too old to have children, God gives them children, gives them a child, they're miraculously parents. And of course, the star remained in the, in the sky to guide the Magi to where Jesus was. And the most famous example of all of breaking the rules of nature is Jesus born to a virgin uh, named Mary. And this is a miracle, is what it is. I got to thinking about miracles. You know, um, if you play golf or you know any golfers, you know the, the highlight of any golfer's golfing history is to get a hole in one. That's what we all dream about. Mine actually rattled the pin one time, but that was as close as what I got. And uh, the odds of making a hole in one are 10,000 to one. I actually think those are pretty good odds. I thought they were much higher than that. But for people with physical challenges, the odds have got to go up even a lot more. So I ran across this guy. This is Leo Ficado. I think that's right. Sorry, Leo, if that's wrong. And he had this miraculous kind of hole in one. At 92 years old and blind, his miracle happened. He had a little peripheral vision in one eye, but as you see, they have to always line Leo up to hit his shot. And uh, despite his handicap, this blind golfer made a hole in one on a 110 yard fifth hole. And catch this, Cave K County Club in Clearwater, Florida. Despite the amazing accomplishment, uh, Leo was kind of low-key about it. He says, I was just trying to put the ball on the green. I think that's pretty close to what his voice is. <laughs> just trying to put the ball on the green. Elsie McLean, uh, she's even older uh, when her miracle struck at in 2007, at age 102, she became the oldest person to ever make a hole-in-one on a regulation course. Catch this, those of you that play golf. She used a driver at the 100-yard fourth hole, okay? So it took her a driver to get there at Birdwell Golf Course in California. Elsie and her partners didn't see where the shot landed. It was too far away, 100 yards. But when they got up to the green, they found the ball in the hole, and she says, it can't be true, it can't be true. And there was a little ball in the hole. So she summed up her accomplishment this way. She says, for an old lady, I still hit the ball pretty good. That was kind of what Elsie sounds like, too. Doing pretty good, aren't it? <laughs> These stories uh, sound miraculous because, you know, blind people aren't supposed to hit those kind of shots, and old people that are 102 are supposed to hit those kind of shots. But it just isn't the way of golf naturally works. But when something goes against the way things are predictably going to turn out, we notice and we say it's a miracle is what this is. And that's why the virgin birth is part of the story, because it gets our attention, among other things. It's in the Apostles' Creed. We say that we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. It's core to the story because it shows that God is doing something that's very unnatural, very against the laws of nature. So here we go. We're going to read the story. Luke 1, 26 to 38. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to see her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. 
the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who, who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in your old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. The woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. Well, you know, it's... It's not surprising that God came to earth, but the way that he came is kind of scandalous. We would think that God would come and make this grand entrance for everyone to see, but instead, you know, he enters as a commoner in a common town to a common family, in a common stable wrapped in just common rags. And most surprisingly at all, of all, he was born to a virgin. And we hear this story so much, I think we forget how extreme it is. An angel broke into to nature and told a teenager who was a, a virgin that God's son was in her womb. Everything the angel predicted actually happened. Broke all the rules. How could an angel suddenly appear? And how could a virgin get pregnant? That's what happened to Mary. And the angel came to Mary and told her, that she was highly favored because God had chosen her to give birth to God's Son, the Messiah. And Mary is confused, or in other translations says, greatly troubled by this because it wasn't possible. At least it wasn't possible under the rules of nature. But God had chosen her to break the rules of nature. It was a scandal. If you ever watch some of the reality shows, there's one on right now that's on MTV called 16 and Pregnant. Um, you start to get maybe a kind of an inkling of the scandal for Mary. Uh, MTV covers uh, the story of teen mothers who aren't married and they go through a great deal of difficulty. And here's one profile. Sabrina used to be a cool California girl with a star athlete boyfriend, a large group of friends, but when she gets pregnant, she must move to her grandparents' house in Tennessee to start a new life. Now, that's coming down from California to grandparents' house in Tennessee. And with her sister there to support her, Sabrina hopes that her boyfriend will finally come to Tennessee to help parent. So you can see kind of the storyline that's going to develop there. Will her boyfriend come or not? Scandalous. Now, the story of Mary is, is much more strenuous. She is shunned by her community. She would endure the shame for her lifetime. The people who saw Mary would look at her as much more of a scandal than teen moms today. But Mary accepted the scandal, you see, and she accepted it as being God's will. Once the angel explained what would happen to Mary, uh, he also told her that God had broken the rules of nature with her cousin Elizabeth. She's pregnant as well. And that too is just more evidence that nothing, as he said, is impossible with God. So Mary's response was to obey and to follow. She said that she was God's servant. She accepted what the angel had said. God was going to break the rules, and Mary was on board with that plan. In fact, God broke all the rules by having Jesus born of a virgin, reminds us that God is above all the rules of nature. Sometimes we forget that. That's because God created the rules. The, the God of the universe set in motion, motion natural laws like gravity and inertia and so many more. But he is the one who created it, and he can suspend them if he needs to. The creator is the one who determined how children were born. So the Creator is the only one who could break the rules. God broke the natural rules to show us that Jesus was not common. And although he was born to a common family in a common town in a common stable, he was uncommon. He was the Son of the Most High. He was the ruler who would reign over Israel forever and ever, and his kingdom would have no end. Jesus was the Christ, the promised Messiah, who would save Israel 
and who would save us. Now, God had promised this. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's some 600 years before the birth of Jesus. So God does exactly what he says he's going to do, even though he had to break some rules. And it's just another way that Christmas points us to the Creator. Throughout Jesus' life, he continued to break the rules of nature, and that's what miracles are. We think of how he raised the dead. He walked on water. Uh, He turned water into wine. Uh, He took a little boy's sack lunch and fed 5,000 with it one day healed leprosy, cast out demons, all miracles. The one who, with the power to make us, is the same one who has the power to lead us. And that's great news for us because at some point in our lives, we're going to need a miracle. Maybe you've needed one already, but at some time you're going to need a miracle. And it may not be just suspending the point of nature. It may be a relationship miracle that you need. It it may be an economic miracle that you need. God doesn't always act miraculously when we tell him to act, but the story reminds us that these things are possible. If God can make a virgin pregnant, almost everything else is possible, isn't it? God can make a virgin pregnant. He can make the rules of nature, break the rules of nature to bring us healing when we need it. Christmas story tells us that miracles are possible, and as a result, we can follow with confidence because Christmas points us to the Creator. The thought of miraculous is kind of evaporating around Christmas. Um, It's kind of going away. There used to be a mystery. Now, probably the most miraculous thing we might have is getting something to 50% off. We think, man... There is a Savior. I got a great deal. That's what it's turning into. But the greatest miracle that many expect is, is not going to die. The meaning of Christmas is not going to die. Christmas points us to the Creator and the good news that nothing is impossible with God. I want us to take that home with us today. I, I, want, I want you to hear that, that phrase uh, all the way through the Christmas season, that nothing is impossible with God. And where do you need a miracle? Maybe, maybe some of us here need a miracle today. Uh, nothing is impossible with God. With every Christmas tree, every Christmas carol, with every manger scene, we ought to remember that nothing is impossible with God. He gives us miracles. Sometimes the miracles aren't easy. You know, Mary had to go along with God's plan to get the miracle. She had to say, let it be to me as you want, Lord. I'll be your handmaiden. It's not an easy thing to do. Miracles don't just always fall out of the sky. Usually it's us saying, yeah, I'll I'll join in your plan. I'll do your will, God. To make Christmas perfect, we have to accept God's will for our lives, and that releases him to do the impossible. So today, are we ready to listen you know, the angel that came, angel in Scripture means messengers. And it, it, we, we may never really hear an angel. We may never have an angel speak to us, but we have all kinds of messengers that God sends to us. God sends people messengers to us all the time to give us his word, to tell us things. Are we listening is my question today. So we don't want to ruin Christmas. Let God do in your life what he wants to do. Believe that he's alive. Believe that nothing is impossible with him. Let's just sit for a minute with that.
fountain Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out